Yeah, making the new IP is, uh, how can I put it? It's just, uh, just don't do it. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's insane. I mean, it's a, it's a very difficult process. You have more questions than you have answers, especially when you come from like, uh, you've been making Uncharted 1 and Uncharted 2, just kind of like, now like things are going, you just kind of like, uh, like good momentum. And then suddenly that momentum like just drops, stops. It's a very challenging process to create a new IP and you're gonna fail over and over again. But that's what it takes. New IPs are really hard. They're hard because you don't know what's fun yet. You're building new tech, new AI, establishing new characters, new art, all this. You don't get to get that controller in your hand for like six months to a year. You don't know. You don't know what it is yet. I remember like ages ago coming on the project and what are the, what are the infected going to do? Like what are they going to do? They're going to behave like this. <laughs> I'm like, okay. We're like trying to imagine what's going to happen. Fast forward like four months. They don't do that at all because no. it didn't work, right? It's hard mode, right? Like it's game <laughs> development on, on, hard, on expert. There's a big thing about making a game, right? Which is a game has to be fun. You get your first build where everything's working. You've got player mechanics. You can run, walk around the world. You can shoot. You can melee attack people. You've got the AI in there. They're very intelligent, very difficult. And it's totally not fun because they snuck up behind you and murdered you in a second and there was no way to figure out what was going on. We're making a game, by the way. Hey, James. <laughs> quite a bit since, um, since I started. I think I was the 12th employee or something back uh, when we got started, but we've tried to stay true to those smaller studio roots. I've been here for 16, going 16 years. There's just no reason to leave. I just I just like the environment here. It's very non-corporate. I think the way we work on Nyog is kind of special because we don't really like hierarchy or bureaucracy and no one is really just just a manager here. Naughty Dog has a very flat structure. Uh, we pretty much all report to the co-presidents uh, and the game directors. I always tell people when we hire them, just like, my job is going to uh, be able to trust you. And that's what I want. I want just to give you something and you just you go with it and I know it's gonna get done. We believe in iteration, we believe in collaboration, and we believe in uh, the people making the game working directly with each other. When we have uh, designers and artists, animators all mixed up, anybody that's working on the same tasks, the same characters, the same areas, put them next to each other so they can communicate a lot better. We don't have a lot of meetings because if you need something to get done, you just walk over and you talk and then you go back to your desk and you finish it up. And I really like that. I like when just I just walk in the office and I see just a designer who's talking with the programmers or programmers uh, over the uh, the animators and talking to them. I think that's when really the uh, magic uh, happens. Naughty Dog, we really try to cultivate a culture where anybody can criticize anybody else's work. And we encourage people to um, to be blunt about it and not try to sugarcoat it too much. Um, it takes uh, too long to, to be nice sometimes. <laughs> it is, it's not personal. It's based on more like how can we make a bear game. Well, we want everybody to have a voice. We want to cut out all the bullshit if we can, making sure that people are making decisions not based on ego, but what is going to benefit the game. When you see that people trust your opinion and that they value it, it's like, it's such a great feeling. You, you really feel like you're working as a team on a collaborative effort. We want to uh, sort of remember where we came from and, and you know why we were successful then and, and try to continue that success now. We make games. That's what we like to do. Back when Uncharted 2 wrapped up and we decided that we were going to uh, build this second team and, and create a, a new project, we kicked around a lot of ideas. Um, one of the very earliest ideas was to go back to Jack and Daxter. It's really near and dear to us. We really love those characters in that universe, and we think that 
you know, there are some interesting stories still to be told there. We started to realize that it was not going to do justice to the the franchise that the, the fans had fallen in love with. It would be shifting it so far in a new direction that um, we felt that that effort would uh, be more justified in, in developing a new IP. Neil and, and Bruce came to Christoph and I and, and said they wanted to do a, a post-apocalyptic game. I think the, the, the core essence of what they wanted to do, though, was to try to tell a story uh, about two people and uh, how their relationship evolved over the course of the entire game. That potential, oh wow, there is something very spe special about that game. The, the, this is going to be polished, like you're not sure if it's gonna work or not, and you have doubts, and like, should we be doing a game like that? Should we be doing a first-person shooter? Whatever, like, you, you, you ask yourselves all those questions. And, you know, the creative director and the game director are the, the, the core of the team that have to really see eye to eye. That's why you have that balance between, like, Bruce and Neil, and Neil's gonna try to push the uh, just the story and the characters, and 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 Bruce is going to try to push that with just the gameplay as well. And so it's kind of like they're those guys are just trying always to find to find the right balance be between the two. It's a it's a very uh, delicate process. We feel that the interactive medium has an untapped potential to touch the feelings of, of, of the player. You have that connectivity, the fact that I'm actually in the world and participating in what's happening on the screen in front of me. It gives us some sort of advantage to make you feel connected with what's actually happening. At Naughty Dog, that's what we're trying to do, is pair story and gameplay together. If we can make you feel like you're actually with these characters on that journey, and you're invested in those stories and those characters, then you're feeling, the, in theory, the same thing that they're feeling. As the story evolved and took different shapes and different forms, the thing that was always there was Joel and Ellie. And because of that, everything kind of uh, grew out of that relationship. We've seen kind of that role of the anti-hero change especially over the last three to five years, to where before it was like you know, the thick neck mercenary kind of guy. For this game specifically, for this story, we needed something new. The reason we didn't want to make Ellie Joel's daughter from the get-go is because it wouldn't have anywhere to go. Of course, at that point, he'd be willing to do anything for his daughter because that is what a dad would do for his daughter. But they didn't even know each other at the beginning of the story. And we start from scratch, and it's almost like the player has the same relationship to Ellie as Joel does. And we could take our time to build that relationship between these characters. And if we do it right, then the player will be feeling that same growth that Joel does. And we're kind of mirroring that, that emotional relationship between the two. <clears throat> what are you doing? Killing time. Well, what am I supposed to do? I am sure you will figure that out. watch is broken. It's exciting that Neil wrote something like this, where he's like, I don't want to make the stereotypical characters. I want to make real people in this crazy situation and these forced to make decisions that are really tough. Like, what would we be like in those situations? I mean, we weren't consciously trying to pick male or female for characters. You just try to pick characters and just be honest with who they are. It almost doesn't matter, right? Joel's daughter could have been Joel's son. Ellie could have been a boy, and Joel might have been Tess. You could have swapped those roles, and I think the story would have still worked. The focus on female strength, it's so unique. You get to see what's so powerful about a woman through all of these female characters, which makes this game wonderful and unique. There's a crew of fireflies that'll meet you at the Capitol building. That's not exactly close. You're capable. You hand her off, come back, the weapons are yours. Double what Robert sold me. Speaking of which, where are they? Back in our camp. We're not smuggling shit until I see them. I want Joel to watch over her. Whoa, whoa, I don't Bullshit, think that's the I'm best not with him. How do you know them? I do think having a strong female character especially like Ellie, is so rare in video games. 
And as a gamer, and more specifically a female gamer, it's frustrating to me because I'll, I'll see sort of the, the stereotypical female character where she's amazingly beautiful and huge boobs and she's there to be either the love interest or just because they're like, well, we need to throw a chick in here. We've seen the strong woman or we've seen the weak woman. We haven't necessarily seen the empowered woman from this kind of standpoint. And there's a, that beautiful scene where Joel finds her inside the house and she's reading through this girl's journal going, is this really what they used to worry about? What, what shirt do I wear and what boy am I gonna go out with? You know, and to be met with those first world problems that we deal with every day and go, how trivial is all of this? I think it's gonna resonate a lot, not just with you know, a female audience, but with a male audience as well. The thing that was intriguing to me after the fact is knowing that we're kind of creating a female action hero in a way, and this is her origin story with Ellie. To sort of be such a strong female character that is completely normal looking, regular t-shirt and jeans, and she's 14 and she is still a total badass, is really exciting to be part of that. There's so few non-sexualized women in video games, uh, especially in the main role, that we were kind of proud that we were creating one. It's very complex, and without the players knowing it, she becomes the protagonist by the end of the story. And that's why she's in the front of the box, and that's why we've been promoting the two of them together so much. Who's there? It is a dual protagonist game, and um, yeah, I guess I, I get nervous to think about it in that way. <laughs> Uh, we couldn't talk about it. In fact, in interviews, we've been lying about it, saying you never play as Ellie because it was so important for that to be a surprise. Sorry, journalists. Here we go. Uh. <laughs> Sorry. Hold on. That's it. The tone of the game was set pretty early on that we knew that we wanted to make a really grounded story. We knew that we wanted to make the player feel the sense of tension and dread and go through the same emotional roller coaster that Joel and Ellie were going through. One of the things we kind of struggled with is to say, well, if we want to really ground this world and make it so like realistic, maybe we shouldn't have anything that could be perceived as a monster. Maybe like by just having an infection that just killed people and it's all about humans and how they deal with this uh, post-apocalyptic society and how different people decide to survive. Maybe that would be enough. And what we realize is because we're making an action game, a lot of the storytelling happens on the joystick. And once we remove the infected, it's like all of a sudden now we can't tell the story through gameplay of what happened to the world. Uh, and that's where we kind of went back and kind of brought the infected back in because it lets you see, once you're fighting them, the threat that people have to deal with that otherwise would just be very cerebral and people could talk about it, but you couldn't necessarily experience it yourself. In a novel, that might work. In a game for us, in a specifically an action game, it didn't work. And from there, when we start kicking around those ideas, and we're just like, what would be cool just to play? The early inception for it really came from a BBC video we saw called Planet Earth, where they were talking about a cordyceps fungus. This Cordyceps fungus gets inside of the brain and controls these ants and mandibles start chomping, they grow up to higher areas, cordyceps fungus sprouts out and then it germinates. And essentially uh, uses them to spread the, its infection, and take over whole colonies, sometimes wiping them out. As soon as we saw it, we were intrigued by the idea of what if it jumped to humans? So what would happen? How would people react? What would happen to society? As we're trying to develop the look of the infected, um, we went through so many different iterations, some that looked really alien and subhuman, um, some that looked just essentially like zombies, uh, and we couldn't find like an original place for them. But one of our artists uh, just did this kind of photo mashup where he took a bunch of images of diseases or images of fungal overgrowth, uh, and he kind of mashed it all together and he threw it on this person. It was a very iterative process, making sure that the fungus felt properly integrated, like it was part of the body, growing out of the body. And not just fungus growing in the head, but it's tearing the face apart, cleft down the middle, this 
gaping maw of a mouth with the crooked teeth. And it's in great agony as its humanity and its brain is still somewhat functioning. Maybe you still have some hu human cognitive abilities or the thought process back here. This isn't some decaying corpse on the ground. This is a living thing that's going to be coming after you in the world. The fungus is always the focal point. So you can see from a distance, oh, this guy's infected. I can tell straight away. And fungus have these beautiful saturated colors. And we really like that conscious of this something so horrific that it's gonna like stop at nothing, it's relentless force of death, and yet it, elements of it are beautiful. It's not just about gore. It's not just about everything about it being scary because to us it's actually scarier when things on it are some, somewhat benign or somewhat beautiful. Uh, it was evident that we were onto something that was quite a bit different and something that we hadn't really seen before, which was eerily human but very disturbing. And it seems so creepy and so unique that right away we're gravitated towards it and it's like, this is our base infected, everything should kind of come out of this look. So once we had this idea of the face splitting kind of look that eventually became what we called the clicker stage. We went to great lengths to create a full biological cycle for these things. So in the early stages, you don't actually see too many signs of uh, the fungus surfacing out of the skin. It's kind of underneath it, like people have lumps starting to show. The eyes will be kind of cloudy um, or lopsided because the fungus kind of originates inside the head. That moves into the next phase, which is the clicking phase. And if they mess with the eyes, we end up saying, well, how do they get around? Oh, echolocation. And they use a form of echolocation to track down their enemies, uh, just like bats or even some blind people can see by making a clicking sound, a sound that on its own wouldn't be very scary. And then to associate it with something that people in this world are very fearful of, so that as you're exploring an environment, all of a sudden you hear this click and you're seeing everybody just get frightened, just everybody duck, everybody hushes. The bloater is the most severe of the stages. So large pieces of the body has been replaced by these kind of fungal plates. The, the fungus completely takes over the body and blooms. They're kind of covered in things that have been growing on them. Things like moss and like little life on life kind of. What the fuck is that? Oh, God damn bloater. When the infected feels like it's gonna die, it finds like a dark corner and it becomes part of the environment. The human elements aren't there anymore. And then the body is gone. They lay down and sprout and then spew spores. And if people can breathe those spores, they become infected as well. It all had to kind of make sense of how each stage flowed from one to the other. And that's hopefully how we've created a world that you can kind of look through it and understand the science behind it and say, I could buy this, I could get into this. Mandatory evacuation. Evacuate to where? Rethink. Quarantine zone. See, some places got a heads up before the infection showed up. Most didn't. Uh, over the course of Joel and Ellie's journey through this game across America, you find all these different societies, all these different enclaves, and you get to see how do they deal with the infected. Without the manifestation of this infection, you can't have these people making those interesting choices. The world we decided was actually its own character, really grounded with a lot of texture. What happens, you know, after 20 years of the fall of man, when no one's taking care of anything? This book called uh, The World Without Us describes in detail how much fighting on a day-to-day -day basis we have to do to keep nature back. And once you stop doing that, how quickly nature can reclaim that. As they talk about New York and how every day they pump water out of the subway system. That system breaks down within two days, a whole city is flooded. And once water gets introduced, then structures collapse pretty quickly. Trees will sprout and wind will carry those seeds over and gutters get clogged. And then when it rains, water fills up and then pretty soon you have vegetation growing over there. And once you have vegetation, concrete breaks pretty easily for when there's a tree and roots breaking through that. 
Even some of the stuff we did on Uncharted, you know, exploration of how temples were ruined, what if you took those ideas and put them in Pittsburgh or Boston? And obviously right when that happened, you can imagine that being pretty terrible to look at. But you think about 20 years later, and with rainwater filling up those sinkholes and then those becoming like little marshes with lily pads in them. We had this wonderful piece of concept art we developed really early on. And there are all of these wild animals that have escaped from a zoo and over the past 20 years have bred and now they have herds roaming these cities. And that's something that tells you that life goes on and this world is worth saving. something really pretty about nature reclaiming its domain once we are gone. So fucking cool. We have another level of OCD of the logic goes into some of these environments. Water damage seeps into them, that creates some little moss growing on the floor, or a tree radiates energy from its base, and that over time starts to melt the snow around, and that's the reason why you'd see those little rings of leaves showing through in the snow. That gives it that extra, you know, believabilities. This is pitch art. I'll try to start with an idea that, that conveys sort of the feel of the environment. Something like this, very brushstrokey, very painterly. You can see not a lot of detail, just energy and, and conveying a mood. This is sort of just a conversation starter. And then this would be more of an actual space. So you start talking about, is this too tight of a space right here? Would the player even fit through there? Do we even want to include water? Those are conversations you start having a little bit later. And then it usually needs several more passes back and forth in order to be tightened up to be the, the experience that you would see in the final product. So, dude, I was actually trying to figure out right here, there should probably be some dead foliage. It might be cool to see some of the dead stuff around the edges of the green or like even spilling out into the street. Maybe what we do is, in some of these areas, we use it as like a transition to form from the actual concrete to the side of the building. So like they're almost sitting on top of a bed of dead foliage, like that really rich kind of like orangey brown yeah. color. Sienna or something would be nice. Something real cheddar. -y. That's how you know you're done. The end product often ends up being stronger because that bouncing back off somebody else gives you a result that maybe you wouldn't have even thought of in the first place. All right, here's the bridge. That's our way out of here. As far as concept art goes, definitely the ultimate goal is just helping everybody as much as possible. Me and the background artists will work together. I'll often just go to them because they've got like a really, really good like visual imagination. At some point, you came in almost like flat on. So that's kind of good because the bus station is right in your peripheral view and, and you're probably going to enter the bus station. You're probably not going to get lost. But it doesn't at all utilize this cool architecture here like the bus station sign. Like that's a really distinctive silhouette and it's a really interesting sort of architectural detail. So we changed the entrance. Look at that, another city, another abandoned quarantine zone. I think it's a better composition anyway. It's not so like symmetrical. Um, and I think that was done so that this sign read better. If you didn't see the white bus on it, you might not know it's a bus station. So I think that helps. But everything we're doing in the environments is relating back to what you should be feeling in the story or what's happening to these characters. So is that everything you hoped for? Jury's still out. But man, you can't deny that view. Come on, this way. When we first came up with Ellie and Joel, we had this idea in our heads of who they would be, but we didn't necessarily know the voice. It took us a while to find our Joel, but for Ellie, I think Ashley was the second or third candidate to walk in, and right away we knew. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Why are you so scared all of a sudden? Because, because I'm a coward, okay? So just get your shit, and let's get out of here. <sighs> Damn it. Like her, you know. What? You think I'm gonna end up like your daughter? The way she delivered the lines, the way she just embodied that character is like, that's Ellie, there's no question about it. I saw the character artwork and I related to her a lot. I mean, she's kind of a tomboy and she's kind of tough and I mean obviously I'm not 14, and I think that's the main difference between the two of us. I read the scenes and I was like, I need to play this part. You want to be my hero? 
Forget the whole bit about saving my life. Buy me a stack of these bad boys instead. Where'd you get that? Back at Bill's. I mean, all this stuff was just lying around. And then once we had her, we said, okay, well, we're gonna do another round. And then we're gonna have Ashley this time in the casting sessions. The chemistry of these two characters was imperative to get right. Troy was a really interesting casting for Joel because when you see Troy, he doesn't look like Joel at all. You know, he's so handsome and he had like, you know, the frosty hair and totally looked like Final Fantasy. And so... <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I don't know. He's like this tall, pretty... Um, it didn't seem right. I walked into the room fully aware that I was the youngest person that they were seeing for this role. There was a line that was in the audition side that says that Joel has few moral lines left across. And so that became the anchor point to the character. But then as soon as he spoke, and he had the grit in his voice, warm, yet kind of dangerous. And his movement is just like, you bought into it. Why are you so scared all of a sudden? Because I'm a big coward, okay? Now pack up your shit and let's go. God damn it. I'm not hurting you now. What? You think I'm gonna end up like your daughter? Lily, you are treading on some very thin ice right now. It was Ellie and Joel. After he read, it was just like, that was, that was it. I've done some video games in the past, but to be handed the mantle of a franchise like this was a pretty big honor. Is she alive? She's alive. She's David's newest pet. Ah! Where? In the town. She's in the town. <laughs> you mark it on the map. It better be the same exact spot your buddy points to. Neil pulled me aside one day, and he said, I have some ideas. And as you're well aware, uh, Neil is a little twisted. He came up with this character, and you know, I just jumped at it. It was such a departure from everything I've done here for Naughty Dog, uh, to say the least. Name's David. This here's my friend James. We're from a larger group. Women, children. They're all very, very hungry. To be able to put on a voice that, you know, hopefully a lot of people won't know, uh, won't notice that it's even me. Because we didn't want it to be Drake. Drake eating people, that's, that's a whole nother game. How did you put it? Tiny pieces. See you tomorrow, Ellie. You know, certain voices that I can do wouldn't fit the David's artwork, and, but he showed me the art, and I, I said, maybe it's something like this, where everything's, you know, it's very quiet, and just, you know, he's not really sure, and the voice can break a little. And he just looked and goes, yeah, that's it. So it, it, I, I'd love to tell you, you know, we hashed it over and we talked. No, it was, it, it just, I looked at the picture and I tried something, he said, yeah. A few weeks back, I uh, sent a group of men out in a nearby town to look for food. Only a few came back. And turns out that the others had been uh, slaughtered by a crazy man. And <laughs> get this, he, he was with a little girl. You see? Everything happens for a reason. Clear. Ashley, she brought humor to it. She just has some really great comedic timing. The way she reacts to the things around the world with a little bit of sarcasm, that teen kind of like trying to get a rise out of you. Right. Now watch your step as you're going out, because it's going to be a little... <laughs> it just brought a certain levity to the story that the story needed. We didn't even realize it needed it until she started doing some of that stuff. Oh, I'm sure your friend will be missing this tonight. Mm -hmm. It's light on the reading, but it's got some interesting photos. Now, now, Ellie, that ain't for kids. Whoa! How how the hell would he even walk around with that thing? Get rid of that. Now, hold Just... your horses. I want to see what all the fuss is about. Oh, why are these all stuck together? Um... <laughs> I'm just fucking with you. Bye-bye, dude. 
Throughout the course of shooting over these past couple of years, Ellie and I have kind of morphed into each other, which I know sounds so cheesy. Neil always asks, he's like, well, what would you do in this situation? I think the most important thing that Ashley brought is a sense of capability to Ellie's character that wasn't there in the beginning. The very first thing we shot involved her being pulled out of a car and attacked, and Joel was supposed to go save her. It was written that Ellie sort of was just kind of watching on the side, just waiting till he was done, and I was a little frustrated because I was like, well, I, if this were real life, I would do something. We did a couple takes, and at some point she walked up to me and she said, I feel like I'd hit him. So we added in a part, like, you know, right there off the bat, she's not just this damsel in distress. Right there, she wanted to fight back from her very first day of shooting. We didn't have it right initially. She needs to be more capable than initially we thought she would be, and actually that made us go back and rethink combat and rethink a lot of the areas in the game. And now she was going to take a much more active part. <laughs> Anything that requires, you know, a lot of body movement, we do with the actors on the mocap stage. And we try as much as possible to use our actual principal actors, use their body motion as well as their voice. We capture it all at once there on the stage. Having the actors perform as well as being recorded at the same time was imperative to get an accurate performance. Because every time you, you split up the performance in any way, you lose some of that magic where they, they did a gesture or they delivered the line a certain way. And those things have to be in sync or there's just something subconscious that's like off-putting about the performance when you don't do it that way. You are treading on some mighty thin ice here. I'm sorry about your daughter, Joel, but I have lost people too. You have no idea what loss is. Everyone I have cared for has either died or left me. Everyone fucking except for you. So don't tell me that I would be safer with someone else because the truth is I would just be more scared. It gives you the most authentic, most realistic performance because you're actually there, not just making your own choices, but making your own choices based on the other people that are involved in that scene. So you get this truly um, natural approach to things and it shows up. It's like theater in the round. You can do anything from any angle and the smallest, most subtle thing will be able to pick up. There's no place to hide. So you have to be as prepared as possible because you have no idea which moments they're gonna use. There are these little improv moments and you know little nuances that you get that probably isn't scripted that just comes out of play, you know, while they're performing. That that mistake that is just blossomed into a really good idea. Did we improv on The Last of Us? Yes. Yes, we did. Doing this was a whole lot like being five, playing in the backyard with a stick, you know, and this is my machine gun, and you know, and a pine cone is, is my hand grenade. It's all your imagination. I'm doing the exact same shit that I did 45 years ago. I just get paid for it now. We square. We're square. And get the fuck out of my town. I don't do a lot of voiceover work, so for me, it was nice to be able to work off of your other actors. I, I can't imagine it working any other way. I'd never done mocap before. I didn't know what to expect. The suits were crazy. Yeah, the suit gave me wedgies. <laughs> like, deep wedgies that I had to pick out with my middle finger. Too much information. <laughs> Just how damn sexy I look in a motion capture suit. I look like 10 pound of sausage in a five pound casing in that thing, man. <laughs> Once you get past the fact that like everybody else and your, you look like weird clown people with these little dots and stuff. Once you like give over to that, it really was pretty easy to make it just feel like you're in the moment and in the scene. So everyone that was on this is a slam dunk. This isn't just another gig to them. And that creates a, a really cool energy for people to really start experimenting and playing jazz. Floor is yours. And action. <laughs> hey, oh, hey. let her go. Don't worry, this is fixable. But I can't come with you. Well, then I'm staying. Ellie. I want Joel to watch over her. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, Absolutely. shit, I will Ellie. Ellie. She's gone too. I could just take her to the North Tunnel and wait for me there. Jesus Christ. Just cargo, Joel. 
How do you know them? You know, we craft the scene out uh, until it has a good feel, and then we pass it off to animation to clean it up. Real life motions don't necessarily always translate into gameplay. There's something that's usually missing, so we have to, you know, maybe enhance the gesture or enhance the shoulder movements or a, a breath that you want to be able to feel, but you don't really see it, so you can't really feel it unless you see it. Is everything all right? Yeah, everything's fine. I could have him lean in here a little bit more, like this, take his hand down. When they're on stage, they don't necessarily have windows, you know, so that weight of like really pushing and leaning in, that's something that we would have to accentuate. You know, give him a little bit more weight on that turn or put his head down a little bit more. There's a lot of dialogue that gets said between the two characters. We have to bring that alive through animation and we have what we're using as gestures. Why would they mow down all these people? You can't let everyone in. If you turn off the sound, you'd know that they were talking to each other. And that really helps accentuate the relationship that the two have together. We have certain animations that play in the beginning of the game on Ellie. She's traveling with Joel, who she doesn't really know. There's a lot of gestures to make her look nervous, just her overall stance. Later on in the game, they develop a relationship through the animation, not just the dialogue. You can see that she's more comfortable around him. If that reads well with the player, then, you know, we're doing our job. We want her to look scared when she gets a gun. We want her to look scared of the gun. See, if, if she's gonna aim, she wouldn't be like super trained aim. She would be more like some scared. But at the same time, it needs to look cool and feel cool to the player that plays. It's really just these little tiny details that we're doing, and it's coming across. It's co it's working out well. We don't do facial capture. We don't track eye movements on stage. It's just the motion capture data. So everything that you see on the faces is hand keyed. As you can see, this is all her mocap data. And so when I'm doing something like this, I go back and forth to the performance that she was giving. And I watch just this section over and over and over again. So this is our default face. I can make everything super extreme and make her all squinty and angry, turn her frown down. I can open her mouth stick her tongue out. <laughs> it's listen, watch. Okay, where where is her mouth at this point? Like is it open? Is it is she making like a grimace? About Tess. I, I don't even know what Here's how this thing's gonna play out. You don't bring up Tess. Ever. Matter of fact, we just keep our histories to ourselves. We shoot all of it to just get the body motion and then we will do a sec a second pass with the cameras. The scene's playing back on an overhead projector, but it's also playing back on a monitor that's attached to my rig. Sean and I would go to the stage and motion capture the camera filming the scene, and so he would get a whole wide shot, a whole close-up for the whole scene. You know, you can change your lenses, you can use your standard 35, 85, 50s, whatever, all that sort of live-action uh, camera cinematography, you can apply it on stage. We make sure to go back in and add flaws we keep the confinements of the room so the camera can't go past a certain wall because then we have this cheated perspective. If the cameraman bumps into the wall, we keep it. You know, missing focus hits when you're pulling focus, going too close to a character and reframing those little moments in there. It kind of keeps it very cinema verite. If everything was too perfect, you wouldn't be able to put your finger on it, but you'd be able to feel it. It would just feel off. It's very much about grounding it, despite having you know, the option to do whatever we want. Being able to place the cameras anywhere we want after the motion capture gives us both advantages and disadvantages. The biggest advantage is it means that we just have to nail the best performances we can get and the luxuries that we can always swap it. The 3D world gives you limitless opportunities with, with cameras and movements, exposures, all that stuff. Most of these cameras are sort of set up like real world cameras. So we have lens, we have f-stop that will create the depth of field. Uh, we have aperture to, you know, set our film back and all that stuff. And a master, and then I have my close-ups, my over-the-shoulders. Sort of just like a live-action production. Let's go to camera 30 at, at the 23.458. Then I get that kind of weird, you know, bend across his back. The closer I bring the camera, the more bend I get, which is, you know, doesn't look right. It doesn't look as, it looks less cinematic than if I do that, which flattens the whole thing. 
and and I'm trying to also catch Ellie. Like if you scrub a little more, you know, catch her in the back here. So I want a sh you know longer lens of that. Since I've only had experience working with live action before I got into video games, it was a kind of a cool adjustment to be able to have this extra flexibility in post, to swap a line of dialogue for something different, even though that's not what the actors said at that time, and to be able to still have a close-up on them while they said it. You get to make it probably more perfect than you could ever make it in live action. How far are we going to take as this? As far as it needs to go. Where was this lab of theirs? Because our actors are both the voice and their body, they get to play, they get to try things, they get to work with our director to kind of come up with new ideas, or even our director will have a new idea on the spot that wasn't there in the script, but realizing when he sees it, oh, well, this would actually be better, this might feel better. And those changes all just happen organically there on the set. He could even lead straight into his thing. It's like, no shit, yep, I would want to do that, so we ran into our and drove cross country. Keep it pretty succinct, like we got the bikes, rode them cross country, cool. It's shocking to me that this is Neil's first time directing. There was a specific tone and a specific uh, approach that, that Neil and Bruce wanted to take with this. It just came down to there's nobody knows this story better than you, and then there's nobody that knows these characters better than you. Why don't you just do this? He and I actually had a conversation about it. He says, I think I'm gonna try this my, uh, myself, and I'm not sure. Neil was fantastic. The floor is yours. <laughs> okay, so remember, you've been running away from this turret mounted truck. If you come to this dead end, you're going to look up and see a potential way out. Okay. And action. Let me check it out. I mean, his writing is honest, and it's dangerous, and it's natural. And I love his economy of words. He doesn't hit everything on the nose, so it leaves it open for you to interpret and bring some nuances and things like that. The entire process is collaborative, but really it's led by Neil's willingness to change and, and, and flow and decide something doesn't work, you know, fix it right there in the moment. And it is... Uh, is something that's very foreign to, to the way that TV and film is done now, where everything has been micromanaged by the time you get it to the table read, and no one wants you to change anything, and everything's very precious and has been rewritten with notes from 20 people in suits, and you can't do that uh, just just uh, anywhere in entertainment these days. Yeah, I just, I want to make sure, I, I think I swung too far over to, to this way, and now it's, it's a little bit of making jokes about it, and we need to bring it back to... To center a There's one scene in the game where um, we see Joel um, not as a ruthless survivor but as a father. I knew from the very beginning that he's gonna lose his daughter and uh, I just told Neil it's like when that day comes for us to shoot that I need a heads up about a week before he said it's time we're gonna do that scene. I was like okay because I knew that I, I was going to have to go to this place that, that you don't really want to go to as an actor. You want to find some aspect of reality that you can um, empathetically draw from, you know? Troy and I were both kind of just like walking around for a while and just kind of getting into the, to the zone. And he, and, well, my grandpa died when I was eight. He was like my dad. And so that, that's always what I use to get into that, that place. You know, I, I started recalling all those memories and starting pulling up all those feelings, and they're just right right underneath the surface. When I walked back in, everyone realized that something was different. They kind of, like, calmed down, you know? You could feel the energy just, like, drop a little bit more. It was brutal. <laughs> I just, I lose my shit. I mean, just completely break down. Please don't do this. Don't do this. Please, God, no. <laughs> oh God, no! <laughs> the sound stage was deathly still. It was the first take, and I felt really good about it. And it's like Neil said, "Okay, let's do it again." And so you do it again, and automatically you feel like you're manufacturing because you're trying to go back to that place, and you know you've, you're in that actor nightmare of you know trying to get back to that reality. And we go through it again in fifth and sixth and seventh take, and I'm just exhausted. I'm crying between takes. And I'm looking at Neil going, this is really, really hard. And um, finally, after like the eighth or ninth take, he said, all right, I think we got it. I was like, oh, thank God. And I went outside, and I was just jacked up for the rest of the day. Just, just I mean, a wreck emotionally. But we got it. Then two weeks later, he calls me. 
And he says, uh, so we need to reshoot a scene. I'm like, cool, what scene are we doing? And he just looks at me. I said, dude, don't do this to me. And you can either at that moment uh, throw your hands up in the air and say, fuck this and walk away. Or you can say, okay, this is an opportunity to get it more right. I'm like, okay, all right. Yeah. You don't think you got it? I'm gonna show you that you got it. We've got it in the can. And so we go through it again, and it just feels fake, feels artificial. And Neil goes, go through it again. We start doing it again. And I'm getting madder and madder with each take. And finally, about the fourth take, <laughs> Neil comes over to me, and we, I love him so much. He goes, so I'm picking up on some resistance. I was like, you're damn right you're picking up on some resistance. We've got this in the can already, and we're just wasting our time, and we're wasting all this effort and energy. And then he started talking me through the scene. And he was like, what I need you to do is I need you to, to just strip yourself of all these ideas, and I need you to hit this beat, and this beat, and this beat, and this beat, which just makes it sound so mechanical, and it's such an emotional scene. So we start going through it, and literally, I am mindlessly doing these things at this point. It's okay. I know it hurts, baby. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so I'm gonna lift you up, I'm gonna lift you up, I'm gonna get you over here. Come on, baby, come on, work with me, please. God, baby. Sarah. Sarah! Don't do this to me, baby. Don't do this to me, baby. Girl, come on. Come. And he stops, he goes, now we got it. And I realized that the reason why I wanted that first take to work was because I wanted everyone to look at me and go, wow, what an actor. And that's not what the scene needed those moments where you just have to sort of calm your ego down and and just go back and do your work. That scene actually works, not because of me, but in spite of me. And that really is the marker and, and definition of working with a true, truly good director. There are many like it, but this one is yours. Why don't you have a seat? Okay. Ah! Thanks, guys. Yeah. Working on the project, we knew we wanted to have a pretty minimalist soundtrack. And we, we had a folder where we just throw music in there. We looked at the folder one day and we saw, we have a lot of stuff here from Gustavo Santolaya. We're looking for a composer. What if we reached out to him? Oh, no. <laughs> Sarah. has been and still is kind of like a road movie. I grew up in Argentina. I came to the United States in 1978 because uh, we had a horrible political situation in Argentina. We had a military dictatorship where 30,000 people disappeared at the hands of the government and many other more were tortured and I was blacklisted. It was just impossible for me to keep on living there. I've been in jailed many times since I was probably 15 years old just because I had long hair and I play an electric guitar. So I, I, I had to embark on this trip. I can relate to that kind of need of movement and going to the next, next place and the next place and the next step. I'm always attracted to uh, the possibility of getting involved with a project from the very beginning. I like to work from the script and talking to the director. It's never been, oh, give me a piece like this or give me a music that's this. It's just been very high level. Here's what the story's about. Here are the themes. Go write some stuff. Since I don't know how to really read or write music, but the way I, I, I produce music is actually recording it. So I like to come early in the projects, and, and, and I did in The Last of Us. Wow. 
one thing that was fantastic from the very, very beginning was the freedom that I had to try and to do whatever I felt could work, you know? As the story was still being written, you could listen to this piece of music and just get a sense of where this needs to go tonally because the music was still inspiring the story. So that was the great thing of having the music written so far in advance. And at the beginning, I mean, I was going really out with some things, and sometimes some of those things were the ones that they liked the most, you know? So I really felt very motivated to work, and I enjoyed Im immensely working. And it was this very organic back and forth experience where one element was inspiring the other and vice versa. I, I needed to go into some more dark places, more textural and not necessarily melodic. I'm always trying to sort of push myself into playing instruments that I don't know how to play. There's an element of uh, danger and innocence. Lennon once said, you know, give me a tuba and I, 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 I will be able to do something. I'm an artist, I, sh I should be able to do something. I like to put myself in that situation. So <clears throat> these are just PVC pipes, the one you see now in construction. Or instruments that I know kind of twist them. From the concept of the prepared piano, you know, I mean, I've worked with, uh, with prepared guitar to stick things into the guitar and things like that. And also in The Last of Us in particular, I work with the detuned guitar. So I, I, I really tune the guitar extremely low. And the result is, you know, strings that are very loose and will produce not only sound, but produce noise. Because I, I believe, you know, every uh, environment has its own sound. We have in our, you know, Small studio, we have actually the possibility to record almost anywhere, including the bathroom, and we have done some fabulous recording, especially in the kitchen. When you score to picture, which is something that I don't do, then you know what you're gonna expect. But when you provide people with music, like I've done in all the films that I've done, and then you see it, how the director decided to use that, you know, in what particular way he, he uses it or where they edit it, it's always fascinating to me. I watch a scene and, and I'm going, you know, it's fantastic how they use this piece. I would have never, of all the music that I've done, probably I would have never used this piece there, but it works you know, great, so I like that, that uh, feeling of uh, collaboration. <laughs> I think, you know, the guys also that work in, in programming and adapting that music to the game, they should share a lot of, of the credit for the, the end result. In the beginning, there was silence. Yes. Then they hired sound designers. Then they, they, regret, they regretted came. that decision. <laughs> much quieter environment like that, we really had to fill out the soundscape with much more natural sounds, much more detailed, delicate sounds. The tension comes from the lack of sound in a way. Your brain is, is, is thrown off because we're expected to hear buses and crowds. All of a sudden I hear wind and leaves rustling. Again, it's creepy and beautiful at the same time because it's almost like I'm going on a hike, but I'm in a downtown area. To Neil, Neil, I mean, we were going through the iteration, so he just did not want, like, 
yells mm-hmm. and screeches and what he called like, you know, kind of witchy qualities, right. the cackling witch. He didn't want anything like that. It was a little bit of a head scratch to figure out, okay, how do we make it sound human, but not human? Yeah. We really did not want to use any animals. We wanted these all to be human. Derek and I basically decided to hire a couple of voice actors who did some interesting work uh, vocally to come see if they can come up with something. And we worked with this girl, Misty Lee. She started giving us these really great screeches. And that's no process. Yeah, that's just her voice. And it started going into this little click. We also used a little bit of Phil's voice. Uh, we'd combine that also with an occasional um, Derek. That's just me, you know, moving my tongue. Just, and what that kind of did was it sort of grounded it all, like, like maybe in, in the mouth area, the wetness, all that kind of stuff. And it adds a nice texture, actually. So this is a composite of all the bits I just told you about. Sounds like a Snapple bottle. Oh, the lid? Like the lid, yeah. Hey, that's a good idea. Fuck, where were you guys like months ago? <laughs> Why did we think of that? Why did we think of that? <laughs> Viewers at home, you're probably wondering what this is. <laughs> Let me tell you. About 10 years ago, I I saw this Synthy A suitcase synth. I wanted to get one. This finally arrived in January, just in time to start using. I thought, well, what can I do with this? Uh, in Lakeside, uh, there's a whiteout that happens, and this thing has a, a noise generator, which gives really convincing wind sound. The military still has technology. There's sirens and, uh, and alarms. So I wanted to try some new concepts. Man. What? Nothing, it's just... I've never seen anything like this, that's all. You mean the woods? Yeah. Never walked in the woods. It's kind of cool. <laughs> we consciously take in consideration uh, lighting in the beginning. Most of the game, we don't really have any real man-made light sources, so everything is naturally lit. In the past, you know, we could use a lot of uh, artificial light, but in a world that has no electricity. We have to uh, hide most of the time, and, and that requires getting very close to certain assets. Just stay back. Otherwise, Detail's expensive, and if you build up too much of it, you end up running into technical problems, right? Your engine slows down. When the frame rate goes down, everyone can bring up the, the profiling tools and see which parts of the frame actually cause the drop of the frame rate. This is the profiling tool. These are all the SPUs. Here's the GPU, and then here's the PPU. You can see, like, here's the main process, and here's all the sub-processes, and you can see, tells you, like, how many milliseconds and cycles it's taking. The programmers are whiz at modifying this stuff and realizing, oh my God, why is this thing so big? We're taking 10 milliseconds on this thing. And then that's when they come over and find somebody and hit them over the head with a club and be like, why are you doing this? I love, we, ha- we put the 30 uh, frames per second goal because that's what we shoot for. <laughs> Someone nicely put the 60 frames per second goal. It's like, yeah, we're not going to hit that. Light errors usually can come up with different lighting setup that still looks great, but, but is less costly in terms of performance. Um, did, did you talk to the character artist about her hand? So her face is getting a lot of speck, but then her arm is just like bone dry. You think something we can tweak in shader? We'll have to send back to uh, character team Michael to take a look. I can play with the lights and see if that creates more like speck. Yeah. I've never ever focused so much on lighting and how much, how much sensitivity there is to that here. 
one of the first lighting scenarios I had to do was like 7 a.m. like overcast. And I'd like wake up early and like take photos with my phone. What color are the shadows? What color is the light? It is a master's course unto itself of how to deal with ambient lighting because I've never had to use it so much. Man, this is kind of sad. What is? All this music that's just sitting here. No one's around to listen to it. I don't know, it doesn't seem right. All the characters cast soft shadows onto the environment. Even when there is no direct sunlight or no direct light sources, we still have nice fuzzy shadows. When you're walking down a hallway and you see your soft shadow goes along with you projecting on the wall on the environment, that make everything look real. Okay. The flashlight brought a whole new spin on it. So some of the environments end up being really, really dark, and you need the flashlight to get around. Uh, give me a hand. <sighs> we want to have the environment be really dark, but also at the same time have colorful surfaces that are sort of hidden. So when a flashlight hits one of those, it bounces off onto the ceiling. If you shine a light on a red wall, it will bounce the red lighting of the whole environment. And it's very difficult to do, very expensive, but we did it. Everything should have a bounce lighting. Otherwise, the world is gonna feel dry and unrealistic. I guess this is where the assholes sleep. I mean, slept. This engine is really driven in a way towards a very high level of cinematic control over each frame. And hopefully, if we achieve our goal, you'll see it is beautiful. There are these truly beautiful moments amid all this chaos and destruction. Yeah, once we're done with this whole thing, I'm gonna teach you how to play guitar. What do you say, huh? It looks like that's a counterweight. Okay. The story really dictates sort of the arc of the overall pacing. Storytelling would always want to be subtle. They would always want to keep the, the world grounded in reality. But gameplay has requirements where the player needs to see this thing. The player needs to immediately know that the enemy is attacking, that this room is dangerous, that this room is a puzzle that you have to solve. What are the things that we can do on the joystick to make you feel the same way that these characters are gonna feel when we get to this next pinch point in the story? There's a turn in a scene that we need these characters to take and we need you to feel it or understand that and that means you have to play it. Sam! Oh, thank God. Why are you running? We really want to make sure that there's that contrast between the negative space and then the high tension spikes. A lot of times we won't play music or we'll play very minimal music just to let you know kind of the state whether you're still in stealth or combat has broken out. Hearing someone's footsteps or hearing a person breathing on the other side of the door has so much tension to it. feel the tension of the world, make you question whether you want to engage with these guys or kind of try to stealth around them. That's another reason why we don't have traditional cover in the game. You smoothly move around everything, contextualizing with the environment, but you're never locked down. We want the player to, with that crafting system, with the scavenging system, with all of the abilities available to them, to constantly be moving around and changing as the moment arises. Gameplay is all about, I have a limited set of tools, and how am I gonna use those tools and those limitations to overcome this obstacle in front of me? And that obstacle might be infected, might be another class of humans that wants to kill me for a bottle of alcohol in my shoes. The 
it's important for us that we don't underplay the violence because then the threat doesn't seem as real. We see video games as this incredible uh, medium to tell stories. We want to treat it as uh, equals to books or comics or TV or movies. This is subject matter that would not be considered out of the ordinary to tell in one of those other forms of entertainment. Fucking hunters. See this kid abandon us. We wanted you to buy just the desperation of these people and why they're behaving this way because it's so brutal. And at the same time, we didn't want to make it so over the top, stylizing it so then it doesn't become as real. It was important for us actually to hit that middle ground where it's kind of disturbing. That glint that's happening on that curvature, it'd be good if there was a way that we can guarantee that from this angle, we're seeing it. Seeing but it's really overall too bright and opaque. Yeah, it looks like paint. Yeah, see the blood on the ground works really well. It's something about the, the other shader is messed up in this environment. We gotta fix that to unify the look. Shouldn't make you giggle or laugh or any of that. You should be kind of appalled by what you have to do, but you understand why you're doing it. You wanna feel each hit. You wanna feel each concussive strike. Lives are at stake. You want a death animation to have impactful performance, not just have a guy keel over in a ragdoll. In real life, a guy hitting a guy takes a half a second, but in the game world, you want that to be as instantaneous as possible. I live my whole life in this very ugly test level. I basically just uh, fight dudes in here all the time. It, all, almost every move is divided between like an intro and a swing. You know, one of the many things I have to end up doing is like counting frames and being like, okay, on frame 18, I want you to get out of here. I want you to be able to start moving. Every hit reaction that an NPC plays, um, they are not necessarily in the correct pose. When you strike them the next time, we just pop them with a zero frame animation change, which is usually kind of a no-no, you know what I mean? Normally you want characters to blend smoothly and realistically into animations. But what we found is that um, you can cover that pop up with a heavy impact. They can go from almost any pose into the pose that the impact starts from, and your eye just covers up the transition for you. So if you throw a brick at a guy, it puts him in this like kind of st staggering stun state. And that changes the moves that you do when you come up and punch him. So now I'm gonna come up and punch him. And now when you're punching him, because you've hit him down, you get this like auto aim moment where you get like a free headshot. I try to make it so that, you know, if you kind of know what you're doing, that you can set yourself up for one plus two equals three. Right here! Memory on a console is a, a very precious resource. All of Joel's animations with every weapon, all the NPC animations, the stealth kills, you know, all of that stuff happening need to fit within a four meg to five meg memory footprint. This is a list of everything that's loaded in game and how much memory it's taking because memory is our most precious resource right now. <laughs> So we have a level, uh, we call it the bookstore, it's in Hunter City, and this is a zone, for example. So when I set an AI to this zone, he will never leave its boundaries. I want guys to guard this exit where you have to go through, so I'll zone a couple guys around there to make sure that they, you know, they can fight you and use all this cover, but they want to stay around this door. This is another key component of the AI, is what we call the nav mesh. This defines the overall play space of where an AI knows he can or cannot go. Hey look, that's where a cover used to be, <laughs> and there's a hole cut out for it, I gotta fix that. Here's some other wonderful things. See these little red polygons? Yeah, that means they're not linking right for some reason, so that means they can't really walk through here properly. It's a bug and I need to fix it. <laughs> Welcome to my life. If you look at a lot of games, NPCs are usually only alive for, you know, a few seconds before the player ends up shooting them and then they're dead. Uh, we want our guys to be much more dangerous and much more threatening, which means they have to be alive for longer, they need to uh, exist in the world for longer, which means you as the player can witness them acting out their uh, behaviors for longer. <laughs> Oh, 
So we've been working uh, really hard on our AI systems. Back of the box, biggest bullet is going to be like AI. So we tried a number of different prototypes with the buddies, uh, including having Ellie be super independent of you. She would try to flank the enemies, get behind them, or get between you and them. And a lot of times those decisions should surprise you, just like a real person, a real character would surprise you. And we discovered after many different prototypes, the best thing for her to do generally is to stay very near you. You need the exploration, you need the scavenging, you need something to say like, okay, if we just crank it to 11 the whole time, then it's, it's pinned up there and there's no time to breathe, no time to assess or analyze, and no, no time to really contrast. There's no way of shifting the pacing. Puzzles are really weird, especially like Naughty Dog puzzles, I think they came, they're very simple and satisfying. Most of this puzzle is strict exploration. You can see the ladder here, you can see the pallet there, uh, you can see where, you can see a clear route up to the ladder. So you're like, okay, maybe I have to get Ellie to the pallet, push the pallet over to this side and like Ellie will climb up and lower the ladder. So that whole part is like, that's not, a puzzle that's not regarded as a puzzle, but when you feel like you've got to the solution and you're like, okay, I'm gonna climb this ladder, and you climb it, it breaks off. Hopefully then the player will feel a little bit stumped and they'll be like, I'm not really sure what I am gonna do now. And so this is where the puzzle starts. Hopefully at this point, like all of the elements that the player needs to solve the puzzle are very familiar to them because they've been through the previous exploration beats. They're improvising with elements that are at their disposal. That's a really sort of like strong theme throughout like The Last of Us. So like you're a survivor, you'll take whatever tools you're given and you'll use them in like creative ways to survive. set out to create something kind of new to Naughty Dog, uh, this crafting system. Our lead designer, uh, Jacob Minkoff, he got this book of like the survivalist handbook and homemade munitions and all sorts of funny stuff. Just start reading about, okay, if I was just wandering around in a collapsed society, this world, what stuff that seems like I could find? Alcohol and sugar, you know, if you want to make a smoke bomb. It's difficult to balance the right amount of resources against what you think the player's going to need and making sure that the player feels like they're getting just enough to survive, but not too much that they feel like they're a powerhouse. We wanted you to be forced to make some choices in the world that showed how depleted the resources were. So if there's a particular point in the story where the characters are having a particularly difficult time surviving, then we want you as the player to be finding fewer items farther apart, harder to survive. We will item starve you at the same time that those, those characters are feeling starved and worn out. Then you expose something to them. Oh, here's a cache, and if I can just get into that cache. Oh, look, there's a wealth of things in here. God, I was so worried. My health was low. I, if, I, if I had run into a combat, because it's always that thing in your head, it's that Hitchcockian thing about the danger that you see is less meaningful than the danger that's in your head. When we're designing the levels, you know, it's nice to have the stuff that we know people are going to encounter. You know, we kind of call this some of the critical path stuff. These are the things that 9 out of 10 players are going to find. They're right in the way. It's where you have to go. And then whenever designing a level, you want to have that, that little nook and cranny, right? You want to reward the player being like, oh, you went over here. And then you also want to have that other second nook and cranny. The player is supposed to go place a ladder here and climb up through the rest of the hotel. But what they can also do is shimmy across this area and I place a really cool like upgrade um, kind of off the beaten path to reward players for exploring. So if they come all the way over here, they're gonna get this really cool training manual 
it's a funny little bit of trivia, the actual, the HUD system, not the menus, not the, like when you hit start and stuff, but the actual HUD system where you see the reticles and stuff, was literally created for an E3 demo early in Uncharted 1, and that's been our HUD system, the foundation of our HUD system for the last four games. First time in Naughty Dog's history, we hired Alex. Uh, she's awesome. Uh, and she's got a really good understanding of UI and how it applies to games. The thing that I hate about any game's UI is when it pulls you out of the game for too long, no one wants to spend time in menus. Nobody loves UI, if we're being honest. <laughs> Weapon slotting has probably gone through more iterations than any other system. The stuff that we finally ended up implementing, you press select, you get into this menu, then you D-pad uh, left and right through, this, through the slots, and then D-pad up and down will change the weapon, and then just you don't have to press X or anything, you just select out of it. When you're still, like Joel is here, that's fine, but then as soon as you get into an actual situation, so I'm gonna go over here and cause some trouble. Okay, so oh, here they come, oh god. All right, so now I'm out of ammo. Now I need to like get back in that menu. I have to like run away from them, get into the menu, get out of it. And it ends up feeling like super clunky. Like again, okay, I'm out of ammo again. Get out of here. I need to take out one of my other long guns. And now Bill's in trouble. Bill's in trouble over here. And I've got to like, get, like I'm in a menu now and it's like, oh shit, whoever designed this UI is so bad. Like, what were they thinking? Bill's gonna die. In theory, it worked. But then in practice, it felt a little clunky. We wanted it to be the absolute minimum amount of button presses. You don't say to yourself, oh, I'm never gonna be able to do this in time, so I'm just going to give up. I'll die, I'll restart, let me try again. You want to always make the player feel that there is a way to survive, they can just do this fast enough. And like, what's gonna go in now, if you just left, right, D-pad through this stuff, you swap out your guns, like between long gun and short gun. If you're now on this gun and you were to hold X to pick your gun, so it all happens within the same system that you're using to slot the weapons. The first iteration that I did on that was awful. It just took way too long <laughs> to get in. It, like, it was just a mess. QA was so upset at me like all the time. I should they hate me now because <laughs> of that system. I think the way the industry is kind of maturing and changing in general, you're seeing a lot more uh, focus and importance on refinement and polish. So having internal QA really helps. The industry is kind of changing from QA being this like, tighten up the graphics on level three bro kind of vibe to like really being a more technical, mental investigative job. On the publisher side, it's more reactive towards the code being delivered in a stable, controlled environment. Whereas on the developer side, um, especially at Naughty Dog, we are going beneath the art and the design. We're given enough weight where we can go up to somebody and be like, look, you have to fix this. Why come over, I'll, I'll, I'll show you. That kind of feedback, I would love to be able to say like, that was us, but it's, it gets so diffused throughout the iteration process that you really, you're just kind of like adding your uh, I guess like genes into the gene pool and then just seeing what happens, you know what I mean? Everyone's working all the time now. Um, but like I, I told people, like seven weeks and then and you can have tons of time off, enjoy the sun, you know? But for now it's like, this is it for everybody. Crunching has been uh, as part of making games. I feel it's human nature, right? If I'm gonna have a guest at home that's gonna come for a couple of weeks, I'm probably gonna clean their room just the day before they arrive, right? And I think it's the same thing. It's just like everything comes together at the end. I personally enjoy crunch. I think you get this like absolute laser focus because it has to come together. 
uh, camaraderie that also comes there's together. a camaraderie totally yeah the vibe is everywhere you know what i mean everyone's kind of like giving it 150 percent at this point we're getting there right you start to get these glimmers and i don't think anyone who doesn't make games realizes how late in the process you get those glimmers one week before we ship that press demo we're all like this kind of sucks what's going on here it's like we need to dig down and find this and in one week like one week the fun came together like you're shooting at a guy and then somebody flanks you and you hit him and you avoid the other guy who's shooting you and then you flank and go behind cover and you're like oh that five seconds in that 15 hour game was really really fun how do we make that five seconds happen thousands more times my favorite video game is making video games. It is as challenging and as complex and as interesting. You know, we had to like try all the things that didn't work. What's hard about crunch? It's like marching through that swamp of it not working. I mean, nothing's ever really final because you can always make something better, always. So we're constantly changing and constantly uh, reiterating and trying to make it better and better and better pretty much until we ship. As an artist, you're never really happy with, with your work. You could be given like 100 years to work on something, you'll still find things to nitpick and things to fix. Yeah, you can work on the game for 10 years and you'll still be crunching at the end. <laughs> so it's like, okay. <laughs> All of a sudden, it's like getting ready one morning in the shower and I was just like, oh yeah, I'm about to ship another title and this is gonna be a really good title. And it gets you excited and you're like, all right. Do I think the game's gonna be good? Yeah, it's gonna be awesome. I think it was good a little while ago, and now we're gonna make it Extra kind good. of amazing. Yeah. <laughs> what it will take to get there in these next five weeks is gonna be a lot. I'm excited, I, I have faith. Every time we're shipping a game, it's terrifying. You just hope for the best. You, you, you don't know, right? I mean, you, like people have different opinions. We have to go with our guts, and I trust the team just to pull it off. This, hands down, is the hardest, most challenging thing I've ever done. We sweat a lot, and we worked a lot, and we all went home tired, you know? Um, but I think that's what's, you're, you're gonna see that on the screen. I think it's gonna pay off. Ellie. Ellie. What? The ladder. Come on. Right. After David, Ellie's visibly distant. You could have done a cutscene to show, hey, you're being very distant, and she's not responding, but to also do that in gameplay to where it's something that you've done just countless times throughout the game with, you know, let me boost you up here, get the ladder, bring it down so we can do this systemic thing. And the character responds with that, and, and you have to actually go over to her and go, hey, come on, the ladder. We've, we've done this, let's do this. It's a, it's a subtle choice. Like Bruce and I talked in the beginning, is like we have these mechanics, how can we exploit them in a narrative sense? And that's one of those opportunities. I just think it's incredible that that happens in game. It's not a cinematic, you know? It's, it's something that adds weight to that controller that they're playing. Wow, so good! <laughs> let's go eat. Let's go eat. <laughs>